So got a lot of folks here joining us today. We're glad you're here. Uh, the Organic Association of Kentucky hosts these on-farm field days for farmers every year. And this year, the majority of them are virtual. So be sure to check in with us um, for some of our other farms we'll be highlighting in 2021. And we are not only um, offering on-farm field days virtually, but we also provide resources for um, our community via the nonprofit organization that we are. Um, we're all about advancing organic regenerative agriculture, improving the health of the environment in our communities and growing ecological resilience, economic viability and socially just futures for Kentucky farmers through these educational, technical and market resources. So through our community, we're offering these farmer field days. We have an annual conference that uh, was virtual for the first time this year. And we have an, a find a farm directory um, helping to promote Oak member farms to Kentuckians looking to connect with healthy foods in their communities. We provide consumer education to those Kentuckians, um, educating them and connecting them with local farms and food. And um, the Kentucky Farm Share Coalition is also promoting CSAs across the state by connecting some of these member organic farms directly with businesses and organizations who incentivize those CSA subscriptions to their employees through workplace wellness programs. Um, in addition, we offer organic transition assistance through our transition trainer program. In the past four years, we've worked with 144 farms to assist them in preparing for organic certification, kind of walking them through that process. Um, these transition trainers are, come onto the farm and help from the paperwork all the way through the certification and the production practices. We have newsletters that keep you up to date with all of that. Please sign up for those if you aren't already. We have one that's farmer focused and one that is consumer focused. So Oak um, is grateful that we have so many partners and folks helping us in doing this work and specifically for this field day, a specialty crop block grant. We're grateful to the USDA AMS and KDA, our local Department of Agriculture um, and their Office of Agricultural Marketing and Product Promotion for that assistance. Very grateful. Um, with, as I mentioned, our transition trainer program is one of many organic production resources. And these specifically on the screen here, we wanna to highlight to you um, that transition trainer program will be available just as this um, slideshow will be available to you with links. Those underlined areas are active links. You're gonna get this um, access to this slideshow, this entire program recorded with the active links also to the Kentucky Department of Agriculture Organic Program. Um, they are a certifier here in the state of Kentucky who farmers may choose to consider using um, for certification. And um, the USDA National Organic Program is who we all look to in that certification for the regulations. Um, the this federal regulatory program develops and enforces those uniform national standards for the organically, agri organically produced products in the United States and beyond. Um, we're going to highlight some of those regulations throughout. And so when you see as under in the bottom right in the orange font that NOP reference, that is to the National Organic Program regulation that's mentioned in the content of that particular slide. So here you see the organic farm do not spray sign that would be on the boundary of a certified organic farm. And calling that out again, this shows you that online you can access all of these regulations and learn a little bit more about them or see what they specifically regulate. Um, and so those in the top left, those orange font regulations 
will be your touch point for those and you can refer back to those in the recording uh, once we've finished this event. So uh, once again, if you have your, your video on, I'll ask that you turn that off so that you can maximize. We have a lot of videos ranging from 30 seconds to three minutes throughout this program and um, you wanna maximize your bandwidth for that. So we're gonna sh shift gears into um, the main attraction today. Maggie Dungan is here with us from Salad Days Farm. She is in Woodford County, Kentucky, and we've got her with us to share a little bit about the farm. Thanks for being here, Maggie. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining. I know if you are uh, farming or anything like that, it's a busy time of the year. So I appreciate you all taking the time and hopefully it'll be valuable. Um, you can read the slide and see this kind of overview of our farm. Um, that's not the most up-to-date uh, Google image. Um, so we have a few more high tunnels in there. Um, but that's mostly um, the main production area. There you can kind of see the fence and stuff. Um, we, of course, are certified organic. Uh, we grow a diversity of vegetables. Basically what we don't grow is um, corn, potatoes, watermelons, and rutabagas, because I don't know anybody that wants a rutabaga. Um, but hopefully I'm gonna talk about a whole bunch of different stuff today. Um, please do ask questions. I'll stay late and answer them um, or, you know, feel free to contact me uh, via email or something. I'm always happy to share um, my knowledge and help uh, fellow people out. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So we do grow year round. Um, uh, most, a lot of that is to do with our five high tunnels. Um, and then we grow in the greenhouse uh, pretty much year round. That's all um, you can see in the left picture. That's our greenhouse. And uh, we do a lot of plant starts um, for sale. Um, that's what a lot of that is right at the moment. Um, and then in the middle, there's the tomatoes. We grow all our tomatoes inside high tunnels. And then kind of on the right, more field production. Um, we, there's a lot of reasons we like to grow year round. Um, we can, um, we have the climate. Um, if Elliot Coleman can do it in Maine, then we can certainly do it here in Kentucky. Um, and the market's there, you know, people eat year round and people want fresh food. Um, and it's a, it's a great way to level the load per se on our farm um, so that we kind of keep going at it all year round. Um, it does slow down a bit in the winter, which is nice, um, but it also allows me to keep my employees on board um, and so that they come back next year and they have steady income. Um, I would highly recommend it if anybody can do it. You know, you don't even have to have a high tunnel or covered space uh, to grow in the winter. Um, and even if you do storage crops and stuff like that, um, just always uh, having something available um, is great for your customers. Um, next slide. So this is, a, it's gonna be a video that starts, um, but I'm talking about cover crops, which um, we utilize a lot on our farm. Um, and I'll talk about it in the video, but um, it, you know, whether you're organic or not, um, I think it's, a great way to add fertility um, and diversity in your farm. Um, and we treat it as a crop. Um, and so it goes into our planning um, and our rotations. Um, and yeah, let's just play the video. As you can see behind me, we have a lot of cover crops. This is our winter cover crop mix. It's a mix of peas, oats, and uh, radish, like a tillage radish. Um, multiple reasons why I use this. It's our main source of fertility on the farm. I don't want to have to, you know, buy um, off-farm inputs. Um, the peas will add nitrogen. 
uh, the oats at biomass, and, and then the tillage radish will break up the soil, any kind of compacted soil, um, and leave lots of space for microbes. And if you can just imagine, this guy is a daikon radish that I just pulled out. So that whole cavity is being opened up um, in the soil. Um, this one over here was planted um, about the first week of September. And this one is probably a four weeks older or so. Um, I'll let this winter kill. Um, just kind of let nature take care of it. And then in the spring, um, we'll tarp it to let it uh, biodegrade some more. Um, and then just lightly harrow it. And then we have our seed bed. Okay, so hopefully that was helpful for you all. Um, it's, you know, now all of that has winter killed um, and it's a great cover for the soil. Um, it's preventing the weeds from growing and erosion. Um, and it's a great mix that um, is pretty easy to work back into the soil. Um, so it doesn't take much. Um, I'm gonna be talking about in another video here, um, our movable high tunnels, we have two of them. Um, and I'm a huge proponent of them, especially um, if you don't have the space to put a bunch of high tunnels or the funds. Um, they are a way to basically rotate um, whatever you're growing inside. Um, so basically just even between my two movable high tunnels, um, I have like five different plots. Um, so I could have a, like a five year rotation for tomatoes or something. Um, we are in uh, my first high tunnel, which is a movable high tunnel. It is the type that uses the wheels that sit on a pipe track. This moves in between two plots, and uh, we'll be seeding in here next week for our winter crops. Um, but right now there's a cover crop on the outside. Previously the tunnel was over there. We also like to put screening on our high tunnels. Um, especially to keep out the cucumber beetles. Um, I grow all my cucumbers inside the tunnels and trellis them up kind of in the same way that the tomatoes are. So this is a summer cover crop. I seeded this probably in late May. It originally was a mix of sorghum sudan grass, sun hemp, millet, buckwheat, uh, and cowpea. It's a mix that um, Seven Springs sells. Um, and then uh, once it gets to a certain height, I mow it using the uh, flail mower that we have a walk-behind tractor. Um, I've already mowed this twice this year. Uh, last time I mowed it, it was about this tall. Um, and the sun hemp, or the sorghum sedan just regrows. So you're just keeping, you just keep adding that biomass. Um, it's very drought tolerant. You know, I don't irrigate this. Um, and of course it will winter kill. Um, probably at the first, you know, good frost we have. Or but it will remain here um, until we um, move our high tunnel again. That's kind of how I add fertility in the high tunnels, especially the movable ones. In the areas it's not, it's always cover crop. Um, so yeah, so here's just some pictures um, of our high tunnels. Um, mostly in the winter, we're growing lettuces um, and other, uh, like arugula, and we put radishes and stuff like that. Um, all my cucumbers, all the tomatoes are grown in a high tunnel. I'll never grow them outside again. Um, mostly just to trellis them up um, and to keep them protected uh, from the rain so you can kind of be in control of its moisture um, and prevent kind of fungal diseases. Um, and then you can see we're building uh, one of the movable high tunnels there. Um, I would say that's one of the biggest challenges in the movable high tunnels is building them. We really had to figure it out ourselves. Um, and um, there's more information out now. Um, but, you know, once, once you build it, like, you know, and it's sitting on that pipe track, it's so easy. Like, you can push it with your hands. Um, it's really great. After time, they settle, um, and then we will move them with. Um, we have two wenches, or we have two vehicles, like a side by sides, 
um, and they have winches on the front and we'll just attach them to each end um, and then pull it that way. So, you know, going smoothly, it can all be done, um, you know, under an hour. Um, I guess we'll go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, so this will be a video um, about tomatoes. Um, do you forgive me? This was kind of at the end of the season, so they, they're not looking their bright, brightest. Um, but yeah, go for it. It's all one variety in here. It's a great tomato. This is um, Johnny's five star, I believe. Um, we use this cello system um, with the hooks that have the string on it so we can lower and lean. So as the plants get taller, we kind of un, we let out some string so that they kind of droop. And then, you know, we'll kind of scoot the hooks down to, to give them room to the grow like that. Um, I, on my cherry tomatoes, I do two liters, which what that means, as you can see, this is planted. Get all that out. So here's where uh, it's planted, and then it has two liters, so we prune it to have basically two stems, and then you can kind of treat each one as a whole nother plant. Um, we prune, at the height of the season, we'll prune at least once a week, if not every like 10 days or so. Um, you know, we'll take out suckers like this. We gave up pruning about a month ago, as you can probably tell. Um, it is the last week of September um, and just kind of have let it get all jungly. Um, just mostly for saving time and knowing, you know, they're they're not going to be in here much longer, probably about three weeks or so. So in here we use um, a tarp. Um, it is white and then it's also black on the other side. We put the white side up to not only reflect light back onto the plants, but it also keeps it cooler in here um, during the summertime. Um, and then irrigation is all done through drip. There's two lines of drip um, for each row of tomatoes. So, uh, can you right click a couple other okay. things Maybe about thermal production. Um, so, <laughs> this picture on the, the far left, um, that's it seems like a million years ago. Um, my farm was like that. Um, there's been a lot of iterations and learning. Uh, I'm all self taught farmer, so um, experience is the best learner. Um, and, you know, over the years, we've really adapted our systems uh, to work um, for us on the farm. You know, we use a lot of the market garden style um, techniques and bed prep and production um, styles, but, you know, no, nothing is one size fits all. Um, so you really like, you know, even if you read all the books and do all the things, you'll learn on your own farm that, you know, you just kind of come up with new ways and what is best for you and certainly your climate as well. Um, uh, let's see, let's go. Yep. So I'm going to talk about tarps in this next video. Um, I know a lot of people use tarps um, for uh, killing sod, keeping things covered. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of them. They're not for everybody, um, you know, certainly depending on the size of your farm. Um, and, you know, they are kind of a pain to move around, but, you know, we have tarp day on the farm and that's where you like get your work out on and um, you feel good afterwards. Um, and, you know, after that tarp's been on there a few weeks, like pulling it back and seeing what the soil's like, I mean, it's just, it's worth it for sure. So, we start. So behind me is um, some tarps. There's actually multiple tarps. We're just going to pile them to store them. This area, actually, we're going to be building a high tunnel uh, later this fall, kind of in November. And so what I'm doing is killing the grass and sod underneath with the tarps. Um, we won't do any kind of plowing or tilling. Um, at, you know, we'll harrow it to break it up. Um, but 
especially when it's hot and sunny, things can break down within weeks, um, whether it's crop residue or sod or, you know, I just use them sometimes to just cover the soil so weeds aren't growing, you know, so I'm not having to actively manage it, you know, before I actually plant something there. Um, these are plastic, um, so they're UV treated. Um, and then for us, one of the challenges is keeping them down and not flying away, especially in spring when it gets really windy. Um, so we use everything from cinder blocks to rock bags to what we call sand snakes. Um, this is actually two inch lay flat that we used previously before we put our irrigation in. Um, and so they're filled um, with sand or rocks. And it's great because it kind of, you can lay them out and uh, you know, use some like that one over there um, is actually a landscape fabric material. So it's permeable. Um, the advantages to that is it's much lighter. Um, the water doesn't pool on it, so like one person can very easily move it. Um, but it doesn't kill things as quickly, um, you know, as the as the solid plastic. They're all 100 feet long and anywhere from 20 to 30 to 50 feet wide. So I've gotten them from all kinds of different places. Um, mostly online, just searching around for the best price. Uh, a lot of those places I can't get them there anymore. They kind of maybe caught on that I was buying all these things cheap. Um, but there is, most recently I buy them from a class farm plastic supply. Um, it's online. I know Farmer's Friends has them. Um, and then you can also buy them where they're black and white and we use those inside our high tunnels with the white side up um, so it'll reflect the light and you know keep it cooler in the in the summertime so those are great for that so i'll just move on and talk about some of the production um, you know we use all these tools whether outside in the field or in the high tunnels um, and there is certainly something to be said about having the right tool for the job, um, just saving labor and time and doing it right the first time. Um, so a lot of the typical um, implements that are attached to, we have a Grillo, walk behind the two wheel tractor. Um, you know, we, we don't even own a tiller. We um, just, the, uh, we'll use the power harrow and the deepest it goes is about three inches. Um, but makes an excellent seed bed um, for transplanting or direct seeding into. Um, the subsoiler also attaches to the uh, Grillo. It is our replacement for a broad fork. Um, we used to broad fork um, and it's great, um, but if you've ever done it, it's time consuming um, and physically taxing, um, you know, so depending on your scale, it might work. Um, but we use the subsoil, we'll make like two or three passes in a 30 inch bed um, that kind of creates that same breakup that the broad fork will have. Um, we use the wheel hoe a lot um, for our weeding, um, whether it's in the paths or in the beds. Um, you know, we don't even use like hand hose or anything like that, um, just because you can get a quicker job done with the wheel hoe. Um, and we have the Jang Cedar, um, pricey, yes, um, but it does a great job um, seeding. We seed every single week. We'll seed our radishes and carrots and beets. Um, and so, you know, we use that every single week to, to direct seed those crops. Um, and then we also use the paper pot transplanter, which I'll talk about later. Um, and then my smartphone, I, hopefully you can see that screenshot. Um, I use that all the time for all kinds of things on the farm, but I use it for my record keeping. What that is right there is a Google form. Um, and I probably have like a dozen Google forms that um, translate into the different records that I need, whether it's for organic production, 
or GAP or third party GAP certified or just, you know, my own records. Um, and so I, I think it's a great way because you can tailor that form to exactly what you need on your farm and what you want it to um, record. And then, you know, it all just files into a spreadsheet and um, you, you know, I reference that spreadsheet all the time, whether it's this year's or last year's. Um, and I can keep track of what was planted when and where and when did I, you know, use a fungicide or, you know, all those things that um, if you're organic, you have to report. Um, I often just kind of print off my spreadsheet and send it in with my OSP. Um, and so, um, yeah, let's go to the next slide. Um, so this is gonna be a video about my greenhouse. Um, my greenhouse is 30 by 30 feet and I wish it was like four times the size. Um, that's kind of my next dream project is to expand the greenhouse um, because we see every single week um, our lettuces that we transplant out and we grow microgreens and pea shoots and we grow them year round. Um, and so that's always happening. And then as you know, you saw previously and what's going on right now in it is all kinds of transplants for sale and you know, the tomatoes for the farm and peppers and stuff like that. And like, it's kind of a madhouse at the moment. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's play it. Greenhouse, um, it is heated with infrared heaters um, that run off propane. We use it almost year round because we transplant every single week, especially the lettuce. And then we also grow microgreens and pea shoots that we grow year round in the greenhouse. Um, this is kind of our seeding area. Um, we use two different mediums based whether it's a microgreen or basically microgreens and pea shoots use ProMix, the organic, you can kind of see the bag. And then everything else, we use the Vermont compost potting mix, the Fort B light. Um, and that's sitting outside. For the paper pot, um, it has its own special tray. It's kind of annoying, you have to buy all those. Um, and then this, this is what one of the chain looks like. It comes like this. You use these spreader bars. them apart so you have all these cells that are connected by the chain and they can come in different lengths either two inches apart four inches apart or six inches apart based on the crop and you can also seed it to where it's every other cell and they'll be like 12 inches apart. so you put the chain on this frame over, fill it with your soil, and the soil will keep the, um, the paper pot spread apart, and then you can take the, this part off. Um, and then there's a drop seeder that we use with it. Um, and since we transplant and seed lettuce every single week, that's a quick process. Um, we'll seed it, and then we'll put it under here. These are uh, misters, the water in the seeds. And then we top everything with vermiculite. Um, and after that, they go into the germination chamber. That's just a chest freezer turned upright. Um, and in the winter, there's a um, light rope that we use to keep it warm in there. Um, and then because it's so moist, the humidity is kept up in there. Um, and that's just great to get an even germination um, because it's dark and temperature controlled. So here's, yeah, here's just kind of some pictures of an employee of mine um, seeding the paper pot. Um, uh, I know there's a lot of questions about, is it uh, certified organic? And it currently is. Um, they just kind of haven't made their final decision about it. Um, I think they're meeting at the end of April to talk about it. Um, hopefully 
they kind of come to a conclusion um, about what's allowed and not. Um, I have received um, some of the hemp paper chop, paper pot chains. Um, I haven't been able to use them yet. Um, they're kind of in the four inch um, spacing, which is the one I've used the least. Um, but I need to find an excuse to plant something and um, try them out and see how they um, how they hold up and you know how they last um, in the soil or whether they degrade. Um, so hopefully that's a, a viable option um, for the organic certifiers. Um, and then we'll see another video of me um, actually using the paper pot um, transplanting out. Um, so we'll see that. Um, next actually yeah so behind me and then this pot is a lot of our fall crops and we have kale cabbage fennel green onions uh transplanted lettuce all of these we use the paper pot transplanter for it's uh makes it very quick um and you know it's it's one of those tools when it works great it's awesome but you know it can be a little frustrating but it's still well worth it it beats um, hand transplanting you, you know green onions are super easy to do and you can get everything a really good head start in the greenhouse with a good germination i do a lot of this uh, transplanted lettuce kind of the organic varieties of the one cut you know kind of like the salanovas but not salanova So just like every farm, we have bugs um, and we have to deal with them. And, you know, being certified organic, we, um, we very rarely use pesticides um, just because a lot of them that I have tried, I don't find to be very effective. And um, we really try to build up our beneficial um, population. And so I wouldn't want to take out any of the good guys. Um, so we have tons of um, praying mantises. Uh, the picture on the far right, those are green lacewing eggs. Um, they love to eat aphids. Um, and then ladybugs are great too. Um, and then above the um, praying mantis is a parasitized uh, green uh, tomato hornworm. We pick those off. Um, and a great way to um, see them is like you can see in the black light picture. So that's going in at the tunnel at night with black light. Um, we have like a headlamp and then they just glow. Like you see even the little tiny, tiny ones um, and you can just pick them off. Um, my only piece of advice for that, if you do do that, um, when, you <laughs> when you have the light on, every single moth in the county comes after you. Um, so I actually wear like my bee suit, um, uh, head part um, just to keep them off. Um, and the other challenge is staying up late enough for it to get dark to go back out there because um, we're just tired. Um, but yeah, well, next slide. Yep, so here's some more things we do. Uh, the diatomaceous earth. Um, that's sprayed that's inside a high tunnel. Um, it kind of works the same way as surround if, uh, the clay, if anybody's used that, you know, it, um, the white deters uh, the bugs and then, you know, hopefully that also um, it will um, kill the beetles as well. Um, we mostly use that in the tunnels just so, cause it doesn't rain in there. And so we don't have to apply it as often or it won't wash away, but you know, you do have to apply it once the plants grow. And um, it makes it a little, little like a winter wonderland in there in the summer. Um, the other thing is the insect netting on the tunnels. Um, that's to keep out, like I said before, the cucumber beetles and squash bugs and stuff like that. Um, it's a game changer. Um, we also have the fence. We have a fence around everything. We have tons of deer, uh, raccoons and groundhogs and all kinds of rabbits. So um, as much as I love animals, I am not here to feed them. Um, and then the flame weeding, um, I'll talk about that in a video, but we, um, I'll use that actually um, to kill bugs along with weeds. So. This is a flame weeder. We, um, we attach a propane tank to it that we carry around on our back. 
we'll use this um, whenever we can, um, especially with direct seeded crops, um, because you can seed the crop um, and then use it after you've already seeded to kill any kind of weeds that have germinated before the crop has germinated. Um, carrots are a great crop since they take so long to germinate. You can really get in there um, and kind of um, kill that first flush of weeds. Um, and it doesn't actually like burn the weed up. What happens is the heat melts the cell wall um, and so they collapse. And so you'll go over it and it's like it looks like it didn't do anything. But then when you come back a couple hours, all the weeds are wilted and dead. So we will also use this hand uh, held uh, torch uh, for flame weeding. Um, not so much on the weeds because it just kind of would take a long time. Um, but I'll use these on squash bugs. Um, so especially like the winter squash, you know, they'll just they'll be covered in squash bugs. Um, and so you can go along and torch the bugs. Um, and then even after we've already picked the squash, um, I'll leave the crop residue out there to attract the squash bugs so I can go in and kind of um, take toll on them. Um, it's, it's a little satisfying. Um, so I'll just show you what it's like. Okay, so we grow everything and we harvest everything and then um, post-harvest handling is a huge part on every farm, um, very important. This is uh, our packing shed. Um, you can see we have like a tub with a bubbler in it um, with a jacuzzi thing that's mostly for our greens and then we spin them in the um, modified uh, washing machines. Um, and then uh, Things like roots get just sprayed outside um, and then everything goes in the walk-in. We have the, the cool bot um, that we built um, in an insulated room. Um, pretty um, kind of standard, very basic, um, all set up to um, just be very efficient with the flow um, and get things in the cooler as quick as possible to um, keep up the quality of the vegetables. Um, a big, next slide. This is um, so a big part of a lot in the packing shed um, in the field is our third party gap certification. Um, we got this because we um, not only do um, all our farmers markets, but we do wholesale um, and we sell to UK. Um, they were they re required it um, as buyers, um, and it's just it's a lot of common sense stuff too. Of you know, like that picture, like don't poop in your fields and wash your hands. And <laughs> um, but it's um, it's it's well worth it, and it's it's not as hard as you might think. Um, we used UK and Brian Brady, um, and I just type just go talk to him, he'll tell you everything and walk you through it and they'll come and do like a mock audit on your farm and um, it's, uh, there's cost share just like there is for the um, certified organic, um, certainly at the moment. So it's well worth it, it'll open doors. Um, you know, it just, just like having the organic seal of proving to people, um, hey, we're organic, you know what that means, um, your buyers, um, they'll know what gap certification is if they're you know, in that market. Um, and a lot of the records that you keep for um, organic certification are the same ones you need for gap. So, you know, you're already doing it. Uh, next. See behind me, this is... Next. Yeah, so that was just a video of me explaining our peppers. We grow a lot of peppers, a lot of different varieties. Um, I grow a lot for a hot sauce company, uh, Green Penguin out of Midway, Kentucky. 
Um, and then we use them ourselves a lot in the value added. Um, so we make a ton of pickles. Um, you can see that little picture on the right. Um, we have hot dills and hot okra. Um, and then we dry the peppers. We have a de dehydrator in our commercial kitchen. Um, and we make pepper jam that's there on the left. Um, I don't even eat most of these peppers. <laughs> um, my husband enjoys them, but um, you know, they're just, um, you know, they're easy to put up, you know, whether you're drying or freezing um, or pickling them. We do like pickled banana peppers um, and they're just, uh, they're a great product. And we we're growing even more this year. Um, so let's see, next slide. So yeah, our value added, um, uh, there'll be a video coming about the commercial kitchen and we built that last year. Uh, but before that, um, I was making a lot of the products in my house kitchen um, under the um, home-based microprocessor. Um, and that now that we have the commercial kitchen, there's, you know, the doors are opened um, and we can do even more kind of, of products. Um, these are just some of them and um, we hope to do a lot more this year. I don't even know what salad dressings, um, you know, it's one of those things of preserving your harvest and um, being having something to sell in the winter, you know, to keep that income coming in. Um, we hardly waste any food on the farm because, you know, if we're not going to sell it, then we'll find a way to, um, value add it. And, you know, like the name says it, adds value and it's, um, you know, you get a good price for it um, and it's not gonna go bad, hopefully. Um, so next is a, yeah, this is our commercial kitchen. Um, we have recently redone the floors. We um, had a company come in and put epoxy on the floor so they're nicer looking um, and easier to clean, but uh, yeah, go ahead. This is new for us this year. This is um, uh, a certified commercial kitchen that we built. We got the KSU Small Farmer Grant um, back in January, I believe, um, to do this project. Um, this is my garage. Um, behind the foamer there is a garage door. So we basically split our garage in half. We built this wall, put in the ceiling part, um, and um, plumbed everything, electrical, um, to kind of uh, increase our value added. I was already doing value added products under the home based microprocessor and I still have that um, certification, but we do a lot of pickles, um, cucumbers, okra, peppers, um, and then jams. And then now we're able to do a lot more products. Um, we do like a salsa fresca that we sell um, at farmers markets and in our farm store. Um, and then over the winter, I really hope to like hone in some new products, you know, using everything from the farm. Um, it's just a great way to um, not let things go to waste and then just people really like that kind of stuff. Um, the main parts of having a commercial kitchen is just being, having all your specs right. Uh, the sinks, we have three different sinks for this space. Uh, there's a three base sink, hand washing sink. And a mop sink um, that's all required. Um, your walls and your ceilings have to be able to be all washed. Um, the stainless steel is great. Um, and then, you know, you haven't inspected and, you know, there's a fee and everything, but um, it really opens up what we're able to make. Um, since we do a lot of canning, this is what I use for my canning pot. Um, it's off of 220 and there is a heating element in the bottom of this pot. Um, but I'm able to fit 32 jars in there at once, um, to can at once, and that's great. This just increases the efficiency. Um, and not to mention just having a dedicated workspace, you know, to do the things instead of in your own kitchen. It's really great. Um, so yeah, this you can just see here is there's my husband building the commercial kitchen, um, and 
Yep, it's just half our garage. Um, and again, one of the greatest things is just having the dedicated space. Um, and you know, you can get a whole crew in there working and um, everybody everybody gets to work in the kitchen that works on the farm. Um, you know, it's just kind of a break from field work. Um, next. So lastly, this is our on-farm store. Um, we um, put this in last year, kind of in response to COVID, losing a lot of our wholesale accounts, um, just school like UK closing. Um, and um, people love it. It's open every single day, eight to eight, all self-serve. You know, hardly ever are there like multiple people there. So, you know, it's very safe um, with social distancing. Um, we have our products. And then there's also we other producers like the green penguin hot sauce and um, eggs and um, honey and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's it's really great. Um, it almost is like a whole nother farmer's market um, in sales wise, which is great um, because we're not manning it. And, um, you know, it's just uh, constantly moving produce throughout the week. Um, so that's kind of it. I like, hopefully you've gotten a um, good sense of our farm and um, what it looks like. Um, you know, certainly if you're in the area, please um, reach out. I'm always happy to show people around. Um, you know, we hope to have some tours um, this year uh, for the public. Um, just because I know that people are interested. Um, but let's, um, let's get to some questions, I guess. Thanks so much, Maggie. We've got a bunch of questions. Um, really quickly, I want to share with you contact information for Maggie, as well as for some of us at Oak. Um, if you're interested, again, you're going to get this recording as well as the live links within the presentation. Um, so contacting Brooke, if you're interested in the transition trainer program, um, me directly, if you're interested in the field days or have comments and feedback. And we are gonna ask for feedback um, via a SurveyMonkey link for today's event from you. So please share that with us. Um, it helps us improve all of these events, whether they're virtual or in person. Um, get those to us. And I know this is a lot to look at at one time, um, but again, you'll get these links, a bunch of organic uh, production resources that we feel are helpful. Um, some were mentioned throughout the presentation, others um, equally helpful, but maybe not mentioned. Um, and one more plug for the remain, remaining field days we have going on this year. All but the last one are planned to be virtual like this one. And I promise we get better at it every time we do it. Um, so the next one will be um, next month. And then we've got one a month for the rest um, of the next six months in October. We hope to be in person. That's still TBD at the University of Kentucky. And so again, give us your feedback via that survey monkey link and um, we'll get into questions now. So Maggie, I'm gonna unmute you once again and um, dive right into these questions. So we got, we got some questions that we ask via the registration and um, do wanna ask you about you mentioned UK and how you were dealing with them and, and COVID um, kind of put a squash on that. And we've got some other farmers who are sharing similar scenarios. Um, what would you say is the best approach to finding new wholesale customers? Um, so I work with a um, food aggregator in Cincinnati called Local Food Connection. Um, that's kind of who I do all the UK stuff through and also other, they work with other grocery stores um, and institutions along with restaurants. Um, I would totally recommend reaching out to them. It's a local food connection um, and they, they're a great segue so that I don't actually have to deal 
<laughs> with the wholesale people um, and they make, they make the magic happen. Um, but, you know, get GAP certified, you know, it's, it's gonna open the doors for you. People will take you seriously. Um, and just um, love people. So um, you mentioned one of the uh, the commercial kitchen was funded via the KSU, the Kentucky State University Small Farm Grant. Um, what other fundings or um, investments have you used to um, to finance the the farm and or the the continual growth of it? Yeah, so we use the KSU Small Farm Grant um, for our commercial kitchen. Um, we also use that to redo our packing shed. Um, that was really just a shed um, before we built all that. Um, so you can get that twice. So we've maxed out on that. Um, and then three out of the five of my high tunnels um, are equip um, through the NRCS. Um, you know, it, it never hurts to apply. You know, I, I really didn't expect to get my third one, um, but part of the reasons I did was being organic. There's a whole nother pool of money certified organic and, you know, that applies to a lot of grants. Um, and so it's just kind of a, a perk um, to be, you know, not have to be um, in such competition for everybody. Um, we also, we've also gotten a few other grants, an educational grant, um, that helped buy our uh, paper pot transplanter. And then we did a lot of work with the schools, our local public schools. Um, and, you know, there's, there's so much money out there um, through USDA and grants and, you know, it never hurts to apply, you know, you know you're not really out much um, just for trying. And for the commercial kitchen grant, would you mind to tell us what specifically that covered? And um, also Lisa's asking about just the ballpark cost to install and what the overall size of that is? Yeah, so the whole space is, um, you know, it's a two car garage that we divide in in half. So just imagine that. Um, the grant is great because it covered, you know, there's no limitations in the KSU grant. Like, so it covered everything from the drywall to the sinks, to the, you know, my knives and, you know, you're not very limited. Um, and it cost us like maybe a couple hundred dollars past 5,000, the grant is $5,000. So um, yeah, the floor that we just put in, I just had to pay for that. And that was like $1,800, but, um, but still, yeah, well worth it, um, especially if you're able to do a lot of the work yourself, um, you know, you're handy, so. Yeah. Um, with the, the greens that you're growing, um, people have asked, how do you get greens that don't taste bitter? How do you grow them all through the, the summer? Um, what are your tips and tricks for year round greens production? Yeah, so lots of water. Um, in some of those videos you probably saw are um, overhead sprinklers. So those are mini wobblers. Um, and there's like five sprinklers in a hundred foot row. Um, and we space them 40, no, 20 feet apart um, in the plots. Um, so in the summer, we have all um, automated irrigation um, and we have in the lettuce plots it's set up on timers so that starting about 10 o'clock in the morning up until about four or five, just kind of depending on the time of the season, the sprinklers will run once an hour um, for three minutes. Um, and it might not seem a lot, but we use sensors. And so we've been able to tell that just running at that will drop the temperature around that lettuce, you know, 10, 15 degrees, and it takes about an hour for it to get back up to what, you know, the air temperature is. Um, and, you know, having all the moisture, you know, you do have to kind of be careful with fungal issues, but um, that's, you know, lettuce is mostly water. And so to not have that bitterness, you know, you've got to keep it irrigated um, and harvested at the right time. You know, we harvest it kind of early or young in the summer to prevent, you know, getting, 
bolted or bitter. Um, you know, some farms use shade cloth. My experience with that is that it's, um, it grows slower because it's getting less sunlight. And so, you know, just sitting longer in the field, um, it gets bitter, you know, so, but other farms have success for it. So again, it's just one of those things you've got to trial it for yourself. All right. Um, we do have some more questions and Maggie and we are going to stay on for a little longer. Um, just noticing the time, it's a little bit after three Eastern time. If anybody needs to leave, this will be recorded and provided to you later. Um, and please fill out that survey monkey link and join us for a future field day. But Maggie, um, several questions regarding your movable high tunnel. Um, I'm going to kind of throw them all at you at once and let me know if you need me to repeat, but it, any wind issues with the, the movable tunnel? Um, and how are you staging, um, how long after the summer crops are in before you see the winter crops transitioning from one plot to the other with those movables? Um, yes, on the wind issues. So ours are, um, we have earth anchors in, and so they are cabled um, to the earth anchors. Um, and even with that, we'll get some movement and they'll come off the track. And so when we go to move them, there is some effort to put it back on the track. Um, but, you know, I've never lost a high tunnel. Um, and, you know, yeah, lots of earth anchors. <laughs> um, and then, and you know, one of the biggest benefits to me about the movable high tunnels is that transition from summer to winter. So imagine you're growing tomatoes in there and it is um, September. Well, about September is when you need to seed that stuff in the, for the winter. Um, but if you have a movable high tunnel, you can, um, in the plot you're going to move it to, seed all your winter stuff. And so it's established, it's growing, and then come that first freeze, your tomatoes die, but everything that's outside is fine because it's a, it's a winter hardy crop. Um, and so you can keep that tomato harvest longer, um, you know, I mean, up to six weeks. Um, and it's the same in the reverse in the spring. Uh, you can move it off those greens and they'll be fine in the spring and get those um, summer crops in. Um, you know, I know that's a huge issue with people that have stationary, and especially if you just have one, um, you, you know, it, you don't want to rip out your tomatoes when they're still producing, so. Um. Um, a couple of questions about um, your supplies. Uh, for your high tunnels, correct me if I'm wrong, Zimmerman's out of Missouri and Schrock's um, mm -hmm. out here in Kentucky, have you been your suppliers for those? Yeah, yeah. So all the stationaries um, came from Shrox. It's a Mennonite outfit. Um, and then uh, Zimmerman's uh, out of Missouri. Um, we we used those for our, our uh, movables and they were great. We worked with them and they actually like made some slight design changes to um, you know, enforce it in certain areas because we knew we, you know, they knew we were moving it. Um, and like your side poles are going to be shorter because you're not actually putting them in the ground. So they went ahead and like, you know, cut them to the right size. Um, and they're very durable. They all have the W truss, um, you know, and so. Um, supplier for your netting that you're using in your tunnels? Yeah, the insect netting. Um, so in the past ones that I've gotten, um, I honestly, I've just found some stuff on eBay. It totally came from China and I bought it and I was like, well, this probably isn't gonna last. And this, but you know, it was cheap enough that it was okay if it was just one season. Well, four seasons later, it's still fine. Um, so I've actually bought more of that. I was um, gonna get some pro to neck this year, um, but I'm having issues getting it come in. Um, and so, you know, and it is much more expensive, um, but I hear it is great stuff. Um, thinking about your biological control, since you're talking about insect netting, what insect has worked the best for you? Those green lace wings or is there something else? 
Um, so I'm actually going to say the ladybugs over the green lace wings. So um, in that picture of the green lace wing eggs, you noticed it was on a tomato. Um, and they like to lay those eggs on smooth things. So like a cucumber or a squash or a tomato that I'm then picking and having to unfortunately wash those eggs off. Um, I wish they would lay them somewhere else. So the ladybugs are great um, because um, you can see them working. You know, the green lace wings, um, yes, they eat more late, uh, aphids, but um, you know, I kind of like to see my things in action and like kind of, okay, it's working, they're eating them. Um, and then, you know, we just have tons of populations of baby um, ladybugs and um, and the green lace wings, I mean, still, they're still coming back every year. So obviously enough eggs are making it. Um, thinking about your tomatoes, um, two different questions. You referenced shade cloth for growing those summer greens. Are you using them for your tomatoes at all on your tunnels? No, I don't. Um, I think it would maybe help. I used to have a very small propagation shed and then I had shade cloth on it and it was, it was very, um, you could really tell the difference. Um, but I just haven't invested in it. Um, what we do, especially on those movables, is where you kind of have to have a modified end wall because you are moving it. Um, all our end walls basically come off. Um, so we don't screen off, we're not trying to screen off the tomatoes. So we'll open up the end walls on the tomatoes. Um, so there's a lot more airflow um, and keeping it cooler. And with high tunnel tomatoes, do you find that pruning for two liters works well for slicer tomatoes as well as those grape and cherry varieties? Uh, only if they're grafted tomatoes on the slicers. Um, if you, in my experience, um, pruning two liters on slicers that are just not grafted, you know, you're really hurting the fruit production. They're going to be a lot smaller. Um, and people want those big ass tomatoes. So um, we'd buy all our grafted, all our slicers we buy in um, and uh, then we grow all the cherries ourselves. And so both the slicers grafted and the cherries will be two liters. Um, kind of an array of remaining questions I'm looking at. So irrigation, Chelsea's asking why the mini wobbler versus the normal and what PSI has worked best for you? We have done so much research and money spent on irrigation. Um, I feel like it's one of those farming subjects that you just you can't find the information for because it is very specific to your farm and what your water pressure is and water source and all that. Um, I think we went with the mini wobblers um, because it just gets better coverage. Um, and, you know, if you're seeding something or transplanting something, you really need to water that in and drips definitely not going to do it. And like we have some bigger sprinklers that we'll use and like they're just not good um, for watering in. Um, um, I don't know what our PSI is. Um, I mean, we have pretty good water pressure, luckily. Um, but, you know, there's all kinds of calculations based on your pipe size and going uphill and how far you're going. Um, and then, I, you know, you can calculate all you want, but I have also found that it just observation um, and seeing what works. Um, and how far apart are you spacing your tomatoes in the tunnels? They're a foot apart. Um, and so we have two, so this is the row of tomatoes. We have two trellis wires at the top. So one tomato will go this way and the other tomato will go this way. So it's like a crisscross. So it kind of almost seems that each tomato is two feet apart, um, even though their roots are one feet apart. Um, Lisa's got a couple of tool questions. The BCS, the subsoiler, do you think it's strong enough for new and compacted ground? Have you tried that or is it, have you only used it in existing beds? No, um, you, I mean, I don't know about like ripping it right through sod. Um, I would say you probably can. Um, we have definitely used it on areas that we have not worked before. 
um, you will want, you have to have wheel weights. Um, so you have to have that, the posts put on your wheels um, and put the weight on there. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's great. And sometimes you're like, okay, let's rip it. And then it just goes through like butter. And you're like, oh, I didn't need to do that. But um, we've never not been able to use it. Yeah. And your paper chain transplanter, are you pulling the paper chain afterwards? Um, do you feel like it breaks down very well? Yeah, we don't. Um, and I don't think it breaks down that great. Um, you know, that might say something to my soil or the paper. Um, you know, that's why I'm interested to see how the hemp does. Um, it does eventually break down, but, you know, it might be there. Like if we had a fall planting, you know, it might be there in the spring. Um, it's kind of unsightly and drives me crazy, but um, it's okay. Yeah. Um, your your deer, your perimeter fencing, your deer fencing, where do you get your post? Uh, Lowe's or Home Depot. Those are just uh, pieces of conduit. Um, they are inch and a half or inch and three quarters. Um, I wouldn't go any smaller. And then on the corner post, we use two inch conduit um, and then have like braces like this. Um, and the braces are put into concrete. Um, and then the wires, um, it's just airline cable. Um, and then a couple of the wires are electrified. Um, and then we just use tensioners um, to make it tight. Um, thinking about your, your soil pH levels and um, what you're doing in the fall to amend and you're growing year round. So maybe it's a fall and spring analysis, but um, as far as looking at your nutrients and your pH, what are you doing to work with that? Yeah, so we try to soil test um, at least once a year, if not twice. Um, and the, the, the pH, you know, getting in our area, it you usually have to raise the pH. Um, so we're adding lime um, and it just takes a while for it to like acclimate and bring it up. Um, I mean, I, I'd say it takes a year, um, but um, in terms of fertility, you know, using the cover crops, um, we will occasionally use compost that we buy in. Um, we mostly use that in the high tunnels just because that's very valuable re um, real estate. Um, and you know, our compost that we buy is not that great really. It's just what we have. Um, but yeah, I mean, even, you know, even when you leave your crop in and it's breaking down back into the soil, that's adding fertility. Like, don't forget about that. Um, you know, when we top turnips, we throw the turnip tops right back on the soil and let them go back in, so. All right, so ending on a high note, what are you most excited about for this upcoming season? Um, probably the same thing I'm excited about every year is that, um, you know, you just learn every time, you know, you learn every day that you're farming. And so, you know, get a few years under you and you like kind of feel like I know what I'm doing and it's exciting to go into the season and just feel armed uh, with more knowledge that you just gained the season before. Um, and, that it, you know, I don't think it ever stops. You know, it's always expanding on itself. So um, I'm excited for that. And I'm just excited, um, you know, to do more value added um, really max out the kitchen um, in our farm store um, and we've got more farmers markets going on so um, yeah well thanks so much maggie for sharing so much of your practice and your time with us and creating and, and putting on this event today um, and thanks to all of you for joining us please give us your feedback it it only helps to make these more helpful for you um, and valuable resources so we appreciate you coming today. Hope to see you at a future field day. And again, Maggie, thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.